The advent of the Labour government brought about a revolutionary change on the scene of Indian politics. On one side, the new British government did not fail to impress India with their eagerness to transfer power to Indian hands. And on the other, they made it clear by their words and deeds that by and large, it would recognize only two political parties in the country for the purpose of negotiation on the future of India, namely the Congress and the League. The cabinet mission which came to India in order to work out a scheme for transfer of power further made this clear and the result consequently was that barring the League which claimed to speak for the large majority of Muslims, the Congress became virtually the sole political organization to speak for India on the question of its future. Here also, notwithstanding the strong demand for Pakistan, which the League had more than once officially put forward, the Labour government was theoretically still wedded to the ideal of united India with which the Congress was in full accord. The Cabinet mission, which came in April 1946, to hold discussions principally with the Congress and League leaders finally announced on the 16th May 1946 its plan for the future government of India based on a federation of the provinces which were to exceed on the subjects of defense, external affairs and communications and in which the residuary powers were to vest in the provinces. It was left to the Indian parties to secure a united India by negotiations in groups but should those negotiations fail the dissenting elements could opt out of the Federation. As regards the states, the Cabinet mission plan virtually conceded theoretical independence to the states since paramountcy was neither to be retained by the British Crown nor transferred to the new Indian government. The states were expected to cooperate in the new development of India and were to negotiate their entry during the building up of new constitutional structure. The events following the Cabinet mission plan are too recent in public memory to need from me any elaboration or recapitulation. For my purposes, it would be enough to say that the imminence of transfer, contrary to the expectation of the British government, widened the gulf between the League and the Congress. This was particularly because of the attitude of Mr. Jinnah, who spurned all attempts on the part of the Congress to seek a rapprochement and insisted on his pound of Pakistan and not a drop less. What is worse, in a desperate last beat of the gambler, once he realized that the game was up, Mr. Jinnah announced the so-called Deliverance Day on the 16th August 1946, which resulted in a bloodbath in Calcutta on an unprecedented scale. The communal poison that was injected into the body politic of India by the British officialdom over a number of years had not only taken a deep root, but also spread far and wide under the direct inspiration of the League and other communal elements in the country. It had now broken out into septic sores at various places, and after the participation of the League in the government of the country, along with the Congress in October 1946, it spread in a more virulent form, particularly in the Punjab and Bengal. It was now quite clear that the coalition government, which had been set up under a false promise of Mr. Jinnah of entering the Constituent Assembly for the purpose of framing an Indian constitution, was virtually functioning in two separate and armed camps, each with its cells at different levels, one trying desperately to save the wreck of Indian unity and the other determined to promote it. Many elements in the Indian states were not quiescent either. They were actively preparing either to declare themselves independent or to set up their own groups as independent units, bargaining for affiliation to bigger units on their own terms. The British government, which by its insistence that the Congress should secure an accord with Mr. Jinnah, was putting a premium on the latter's intransigence, decided in February 1947 to make a desperate bid to bring about an agreed settlement. It fixed a date for its departure, namely June 1948, from India and offered to hand over in the absence of an agreement between the political parties the power to such other responsible authorities as might exist in the country. After this declaration, 
the Congress, in a disparate attempt to preserve Indian unity, offered to accept dominion status and requested the British government to transfer power to India on that basis. But the new Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, who relieved Lord Wevel in March 1947, came with a different mission and different ideas. After detailed negotiations with the parties, he came to the conclusion that it was futile to expect an agreement on the basis of which the transfer of power could be made to a central authority and sent a mission to London suggesting the transfer of authority to provinces and virtually leaving the Indian states to their own resources at the time of the transfer of power. The battle for India's unity, which had ruled our minds according to philosophical and idealistic concept for centuries, was lost, but again mostly won during those fateful days of April-May 1947. The communal conflagration had broken out on an extensive scale in the Punjab. Sporadic outbreaks had occurred in Bombay, Bihar, nearer Delhi and Delhi itself. The British government, according to Sardar, did not govern and would not let us govern. The demon of lawlessness could not be exercised except by determined and concerted action. Instead, the leak from within the coalition government had put spokes in the machinery of government and successfully halted its action. The steel frame had developed serious dents. Punjab, Bengal, and Assam were uncertain of their future owing to the prospect of the division under the cabinet mission plan. The league leadership had succeeded in exploiting the fear of consequences that had gripped British authority in India. The provincial governments were divided into two camps. Communal claims were being actively canvassed by representatives of different communal parties. The administrative fabric was giving way to the psychology of threatened civil war and league sabotage. The princes were playing their own game of intrigues, barring some like Bikaner, Baroda and Patiala, who were opposing the international lead of Bhopal, who was the chancellor. Others were sitting on the fence. They had sat on it so long that the iron seemed to be entering their souls. In this vast desert of anti-national developments, Congress ideology of United India was the only oasis. It was, however, faced with overwhelming odds, namely a combination of circumstances, political conflicts, communal rioting, British apathy and helplessness, and the premium on intransigence, which its policy placed the horizontal and vertical divisions into which both central and provincial administrations had been divided, and the prospect of a complete breakdown of peace, tranquility and good government which was threatened. The scheme of transfer of authority to provinces and freedom to the states to order their future as they liked, which in view of the planned absence of a central authority meant only anarchy and chaos, was for the Congress the last straw on the camel's back. The choice before the Congress leaders was, as Sardar put it, to let the whole of India go the Pakistan way or to keep together 75 to 80 percent of the country. The choice was as difficult as it was unavoidable. The die was cast in Simla. During the discussions between Pandit Nehru and Lord Mountbatten, with the full support of Sardar, and the plan for transfer to provinces was abandoned in favor of transfer to the dominions, India and Pakistan, involving a division of Punjab and Bengal, and a plebiscite in Northwest Frontier Province to opt either for India or Pakistan. In a desperate move, Sardar tried to secure an option for independence as well, but failed. What followed subsequently is a matter of recent history. Sufficient it is for my purpose to say that notwithstanding the AICC's assertion in its resolution, the geography in the mountains and the seas fashioned India as it is, and no human agency can change that shape or come in the way of our destiny, despite the recognition that economic circumstances and the insistent demands of international affairs make the unity of India still more necessary. And in spite of the firm expression of faith that the picture of India we have learned to cherish will remain in our minds and our hearts, congressmen who had been passionately and uncompromisingly devoted and dedicated to Indian unity had to submit 
to the severance of two limbs from it, one on the right and the other on the left. This, however, applied only to the part of India that was British in nomenclature. The Indian states, 562 in number and nearly one half in area and one fourth in population, were still outside the pale of the two dominions. They had theoretically the option to join either of the two dominions, but Lord Mountbatten, in expounding the position to the states after sounding Sarda, made it clear to the representatives the same evening as he announced his famous 3rd June plan, and it was improbable that the two dominions would have such loose centers as were originally contemplated under the cabinet mission plan, and that the states would have to negotiate with the two dominions about their future. He also exhorted them to cast their minds forward 10 years and consider what the situation in the country and the world as a whole was likely to be. He also indicated that the British government could not recognize any other dominion in the subcontinent and subsequently went to the extent of emphasizing geographical and other compulsions which must determine the choice of a state for affiliation to one dominion or the other. Later, he actively participated in the conference of the states convened in Delhi to determine their choice and skillfully and adroitly persuaded most of them with the help of Sardar and his Secretary of State's Ministry, Mr. V.P. Menon, to fall in line with Sardar's offer of accession to India on defense, external affairs and communications and enter into a standstill agreement to maintain the status quo. There is no doubt that thereby Lord Mountbatten rendered a service to the cause of Indian unity for which we must be eternally grateful. In the meantime, a momentous decision to promote that cause had been taken by the creation of a state's ministry in the Indian Dominion and placing Sardar at its head. He signaled his assumption of office on the 5th of July, 1947, with a statement which even today and will for all time to come rank as an outstanding piece of practical wisdom and statesmanship. He appealed to the patriotism of the princes, to the paramountcy of common interests, to their good sense, and to the common devotion to the motherland. He said, this country with its institutions is the proud heritage of the people who inhabit it. It is an accident that some live in the States and some in British India, but all alike partake of its culture and character. We are all knit together by bonds of blood and feeling no less than of self-interest. None can segregate us into segments. No impassable barriers can be set up between us. I suggest that it is therefore better for us to make laws sitting together as friends than to make treaties as aliens. I invite my friends, the rulers of states and their people, to the councils of the Constituent Assembly in this spirit of friendliness and cooperation in a joint endeavor inspired by common allegiance to our motherland for the common good of us all. The statement stressed that they were no enemies of the princely order, but on the other hand wished them and the people under their ages all prosperity, contentment and happiness. He also said, nor would it be my policy to conduct the relations of the new department with the states in any manner which severs of the domination of one over the other. If there would be any domination, it would be that of our mutual interests and welfare. The statement ended with the appeal, we are at a momentous stage in the history of India. By common endeavor, we can raise the country to a new greatness while lack of unity will expose us to fresh calamities. I hope the Indian states will bear in mind that the alternative to cooperation in the general interest is anarchy and chaos, which will overwhelm great and small in a common ruin if we are unable to act together in the minimum of common tax. I have advisedly reproduced these words, pregnant with future policy, to show how the ideological concept of India's integrity and unity dominated Sardar's approach to the country's problems and how that magic wand he deftly used 
with his own infectious sincerity and conviction and successfully willed it from time to time to work miracles as only he could. The response to Sardar's appeal and Mountbatten's efforts was electrical. All the states within the geographical ambit of India opted for accession to India, barring Junagadh, Kashmir, and Hyderabad. How close we were to fragmentation of the country in August 1947 would be clear from the fact that not only did these states stand out, but even states like Travancore, Bhopal, Indore, Dholpur, Bharatpur, Jodhpur, Bilaspur, and Nabha created difficulties of one kind or the other, and that while Travancore and Jodhpur could be brought round earlier, the others waited almost up to the day of independence to hand over accession documents, some of them even intrigued with Mr. Jinnah in a common design to stab the Indian dominion in the back. At the time the accession of the Indian states to the Indian dominion was achieved, it was hailed in itself as a great achievement. There is no doubt that the bringing of more than 550 units, which had, under the Indian Independence Act, acquired the right, if they so wished, to remain independent into a common federation with the Indian dominion, was, as Lord Mountbatten put it, a great triumph for the realism and sense of responsibility of the rulers and the governments of the states, as well as for the government of India. He paid a just tribute to Sardar as a far-sighted statesman whose masterly handling of the rulers, according to Mr. V.P. Menon, was the foremost factor in the success of the accession policy. During the arduous process of negotiations with these states, packed within a short period of three weeks, Sardar had brought to bear on the task his unfailing politeness, shrewd judgment, tact, patriotism, and statesmanship for which he had by now become well known in addition to his having acquired the reputation of the Iron Man of India. The princes recognized in him a person who, as the late Nawab Zada Liaqat Ali Khan put it, said what he meant and meant what he said. It was this factor, combined with the recognition of him as a stable force in Indian politics and as one who would always extend to them his deep insight and understanding created amongst the princes an unprecedented spirit of confidence in his judgment and sense of finality in his decisions. The princes who played the leading part in bringing about this transformation and who are deserving of grateful recognition from us for their services were His Highness the Jam Sahib of Navanagar, the Maharaj of Patiala, the Maharaj of Bikaner, the Maharaj of Gawalier and the Gayakwar of Baroda. Little did many know at the time the working of Sardar's mind as regards the future of the states which had acceded to the Indian dominion. He was, however, aware of the backwaters of administration and economic development which a large majority of them were. He also knew the problem of the smaller states which could not sustain a responsible administration or meet the demands of modern progress yet were entitled to a separate existence under the constitutional arrangements that had been reached. He was, however, preoccupied with the immediate problems of restoring law and order in large areas of the Punjab on both sides of the border and the many intricate problems of partition, the burden of which fell almost entirely on him. His work, which involved concentrated and detailed problems of partition between the two dominions, gave him hardly much time for anything else. Notwithstanding these preoccupations, however, he took measures <coughs> that absorbed the shock of division of administration. Though his foresight and his control over the situation, it became possible to confine disorders largely to the area of the Punjab, which unfortunately was plunged on both sides of the frontier into a bloodbath, the like of which this country had not witnessed for a long time. It was, however, his dramatic rush to Amritsar in the beginning of September that paved the way for the restoration of peaceful conditions on this side of the border. It is a tribute 
<clears throat> to his magic influence over the Sikh and the Hindu communities in the Punjab that almost the very next day of his visit, the incident ceased and long caravans of refugees on both sides of the frontier could secure a free and uninterrupted passage from one side to the other. The Pakistan government responded and we were able to effect in a peaceful way exchange of populations with despite the history of peaceful and amicable neighborliness for centuries had become an almost intolerable burden to the majority communities on either side. For the devotees of Indian unity, it was a sad and tragic experience. One could hardly have imagined a few years earlier, or even at the time the decision of partition was taken, that the cost of preserving the maximum amount of unity <coughs> with the division of India into two would be so great, or that human sacrifice at the shrine of peace and integrity of the territories on both sides would be so heavy, or that an explosive situation all over the Punjab would prevail, which would indicate that men were not men and law was not law. The depths of bestiality and brutality to which Indian humanity sank during those days must be a matter of eternal shame to all of us, whether we are Hindus or Muslims or Sikhs, or whether in India or in Pakistan. There is no doubt that it was due mostly to the leadership of the Prime Minister and Sardar and the influence of Gandhiji that we were able to survive the violent earthquake that shook us almost to the foundations. But for that survival, within three or four months of the most difficult period in our history, we would have been unable to seek a career of peace and progress in the years that followed. But the greatest sacrifice of all for the cause of Indian unity and secularism had yet to be made. And when the assassin's bullet put an end to the life of the father of the nation, little did the murderer and his supporters imagine that the cause of unity had received popular strength much harder than concrete or steel, and that even the severest shock could not shake or cause any dent into that holy structure. In the meantime, the leadership of the Prime Minister and Sardar had succeeded in securing a quick consolidation of the large part of India that remained with us. As Lord Mountbatten had foretold, the new structure was much stronger than the loose federation contemplated by the Cabinet Mission Plan. The provinces were more closely knit into an integrated system under the aegis of a strong central government and the administration everywhere was run by the Congress, a powerful political organization which had acquired an overwhelming strength by its leadership and sacrifice during the struggle for independence and by the quick adaptation to the administrative role both in the provinces and in the center. The accession of the Indian states had set at rest the specter of balkanization and the country could legitimately claim an achievement of unity which had eluded it during the centuries of its existence. What was even more remarkable was that in our breakthrough, the thickets of the problems posed by partition and the aftermath, it was the democratic leadership of the Prime Minister and Sardar and not totalitarianism or dictatorship that had proved sufficient to nurse and nourish, strengthen and instruct the new infant. It was during this process of consolidation that the first, first bloodless revolution was effected by eliminating a grave threat to consolidation and unity that was posed by the accession of Junagadh state in Katiawad to Pakistan. That accession was the first act of treachery by a ruling prince as well as by the new dominion of Pakistan against India. It strained to the utmost the relationship between the two new dominions, but a solution by resort to force was impossible. Quietly, patiently, and skillfully, Sardar worked his way to the solution of that problem, and a situation was created in which the administration by the Nawab or his Diwan became impossible, and Junagadh fell to India like a ripe apple. As the first outstanding triumph of Sardar's technique after independence, in the field of consolidation of states, it gripped the imagination 
of the people of the country. But what followed in December, when he brought about the integration of the smaller states in Orissa and Chhattisgarh, literally took our breath away. No doubt, the position in these states had been favorably affected by the changes that had been brought about as a result of independence, and hopes and aspirations had overlapped the boundaries between the former British India and the Indian states. The rulers of these states, who had been held in position by the British authority, had begun to feel the effects of the change. But none could have foreseen that in a matter of two days, the Orissa and Chhattisgarh states, numbering 39 and covering an area of about 56,000 miles, with a revenue of 20 million rupees and a population of 7 millions, could be absorbed peacefully in the contiguous areas of Orissa and central provinces. It was for the first time after this achievement that Sardar gave some glimpses of his policy in regard to the states in the statement that he issued on the 16th December 1947 on his return to Delhi after these two initial trials. He said, this is All India Radio It should be obvious to everyone, however, that even democracy and democratic institutions can function efficiently only where the unit to which these are applied can subsist in a fairly autonomous existence, where on account of smallness of its size, isolation of its situation, the inseparable link with a neighboring autonomous territory, be it a province or a bigger state, in practically all economic matters of everyday life, the inadequacy of resources to open up its economic potentialities, the backwardness of its people, and the sheer incapacity to shoulder a self-contained administration, a state is unable to afford a modern system of government. Both democratization and integration are clearly and unmistakably indicated. The process of integration had well begun, and two historical anomalies that had existed for centuries were eliminated, perhaps in some of the most backward areas of the country. The spark that was generated in those areas soon kindled into a flame, and the torch of integration that Sardar carried found its way soon after to the Deccan states, Kolhapur, Gujarat, and Punjab states, and other smaller states elsewhere in the country. But the greatest triumph of Sardar those days was in Kathiawar, the integration of which he had pledged himself to Gandhiji, and the accomplishment of which Gandhiji had the good fortune to see in his own lifetime. 220 states containing 449 units with several scattered islands and territories divided the map of Kathiawar into about 860 different areas. Sardar was in a hurry to achieve this task because he had made up his mind to resign from the government owing to certain unfortunate differences that had developed. He therefore made it a point to visit Bombay and Ahmedabad to be nearer the scene of activity and sent Mr. V.P. Menon and his officers to Kathiawar for negotiations with the rulers. It was at Ahmedabad in January 1948 that Mr. V.P. Menon communicated to him the willingness of the rulers to form a united state of Kathiawar, and I could see on Sardar's face visible evidence of glory and achievement in his own ground. With the virtual completion of the integration of the smaller states, Sardar diverted his attention to the problems of bigger states, more or less on the pattern of Kathiawar. To some extent, the progress was halted by Sardar's unfortunate illness as a result of an attack of coronary thrombosis in March 1948. But despite this, and under his guidance from the sick bed or convalescence, or from his rest in Dehradun, the states of Himachal Pradesh, Vindhya Pradesh, Pepsu, Madhya Bharat, and Rajasthan, excluding the states of Jaipur, Jodhpur, and Bikaner, had been formed after protracted and skillful negotiations with the rulers. This process of integration was in a way analogous to that of Chhattisgarh and eastern states, because the smaller states were formed into one union in association with the adjoining bigger states. Thus, the nucleus of India Pradesh was Reva, the nucleus Pepsu was Patiala, Gwalior and Indore were the major states in the union of Madhya Bharat, and Udaipur was the nucleus of the United States of Rajasthan. It was a skillful move 
to center integration around the bigger states, for it emphasized the uniformity of treatment between the Indian states and provinces, and at the same time, drastically reduced the multiplicity of comparatively small states. By investing the headship of these unions in the rulers, Sardar had given practical proof of his statement of the 16th December 1947, to which I have already referred, and in which he had given expression to his belief that the future of the princes lay in the service of their people and the country and not in the continued assertion of their autocracy. Apart from this, the process of integration had enlarged the boundaries of responsible government in the states, and greater progress in the evolution of political party and responsible government in the bigger states was utilized to promote the cause of democracy in the smaller ones. The efforts of Sardar were not conf confined only to securing integration. He was aware of the danger inherent in a quick advance towards responsible government, and he set up a regime of tutelage in which more matured and developed democracy in the Indian provinces and the center could sustain the growth of democracy and responsible government in these new units. A process of administrative assimilation between these new units and the old provinces was introduced at a rapid pace. It is surprising how quickly the mind of Sardar was working towards the final picture of integration. Although he was trying to progress gradually, he was marching fast as well. From the integration of smaller states to the provinces, he had progressed within less than a year towards integration of smaller states with bigger ones. He had also started swiftly on the path of uniformity and unification along with democratization. Even whilst this process was on, he had begun to think of accession of these new units and the bigger units to the Indian Dominion, more or less on the same lines as the provinces. There were, however, two threats to Indian unity that were still existing. One was Kashmir and the other was Hyderabad. In Kashmir, the aggressive hand of Pakistan had flung its might in all its nakedness in October 1947. The state had acceded to India and we rushed to its defense. The challenge had thus been met by resoluteness, but a large part of the state had gone to Pakistan and the United Nations became seized of the dispute. After its affiliation to India, however, the state has made constitutional, administrative and economic progress of a high order, and today it has taken its due and honored place among the constituent elements of the Indian Union. The state of Hyderabad was, however, in a different category. Although it had not formally acceded to Pakistan, there was no doubt of a sentimental and religious link between certain elements in the state and even in the ruling administration and Pakistan. In fact, there could be no doubt that Pakistan was intriguing about its position vis-a-vis -vis India. A militant communal organization was making a mockery of peace and tranquility, not only in the state, but also on its borders. Concessions, persuasions, and peaceful offers had failed to evoke any response. At the same time, the threat to India's unity and security posed by this ulcer in the belly of India, as Sardar called it, was increasing and finally, there was no escape from a surgical operation. With my familiarity of the events at the time, I can say that but for the masterly surgical skill of Sardar and his determination and single-minded devotion to the cause of Indian unity, that operation would not have been successfully performed and the state of Hyderabad would have continued to be a running sore in our body politic. He was, however, generous in victory, and the Nizam would be the first to acknowledge that he was not only treated liberally, but considerately, by one who had the reputation of hardness and strength. To my mind, the elimination of Hyderabad problem by the police action was a major contribution to the consolidation of Indian unity which, because of the danger that it posed, could not rank below the accession of all the other states combined to the Indian Union. Once the Hyderabad question was settled in a manner which safeguarded the interests of Indian unity and security, Sardar was free to take up the bigger question, 
which he had already posed much earlier, of integrating the new unions and the individual bigger states into, into the constitutional system of India. Negotiations were accordingly set afoot for the complete accession of the unions of states to the Indian Union under the Constitution on all subjects in which the Union authority extended to the Indian provinces. With the growth of democratization in the new unions and the manner in which Sardar handled both the new Raj Pramukhs and the popular leaders of these states, the problem of administrative and other constitutional integration with safeguards for the interim period was not difficult. But the financial problems gave rise to considerable difficulty and needed prolonged inquiry and consideration. Accordingly, a financial inquiry committee was appointed under the chairmanship of Sri Viti Krishnamachari, whose report is to my mind an outstanding document on the financial problems of the new federation as well as the states. The committee laid down the following broad principles for financial integration and the proposals relating to individual states were worked out generally in accordance with these principles. They are as follows. Federal financial integration must be based upon complete equality between provinces and states in the following respects. The central government should perform the same functions and exercise the same powers in states as in provinces. The central government should function through its own executive organizations in states as in provinces. There should be uniformity and equality in the basis of contributions to central resources from provinces and states. There should be equality of treatment as between provinces and states in the matter of common services rendered by the central government and as regards the sharing of divisible federal taxes, grants in aids, subsidies, and all other forms of financial and technical assistance. I might also refer to another financial consequence of securing the integration of the states, namely the grant of privy purses to the rulers. The total amount of these payments, which was the price that the country paid for the surrender of sovereignties and dominions by the rulers to the former dominion, and now the Indian Union, came to about rupees four crores. When we consider the advantages which the country has derived from this integration and the conditions that prevailed in August 1947, I make bold to say that not only would it be ungenerous and petty-minded to question the settlements, but it would be immoral to disown them. This is particularly so when we realize that those settlements were reached at a time when the other party could bargain as against the present position when that party is at the mercy of the present government and parliament. On this aspect, as well as the broader aspect of integration, I would let Sardar speak for himself as he spoke on the article of the Constitution relating to settlements with the rulers and integration of states in the Constituent Assembly. He justified the settlements in the following words. Human memory is proverbially short. Meeting in October 1949, we are apt to forget the magnitude of the problem which confronted us in August 1947. As the honorable members are aware, the so-called lapse of paramountcy was a part of the plan announced in June 3rd, 1947, which was accepted by the Congress. We agreed to the partition of India. We accepted it because we had no option to act otherwise. While there was recognition in the various announcements of the British government of the fundamental fact that each state would link up its future with that of dominion with which it was geographically contiguous, the Indian Independence Act released the states from all their obligations to the British Crown. In their various authoritative pronouncements, the British spokesmen recognized that with the lapse of paramountcy, technically and legally, the states would become independent. They even conceded that theoretically the states were free to link their future with whichever dominion they liked, although in saying so, they referred to certain geographical compulsions which could not be evaded. The situation was indeed fraught with immeasurable potentialities of disruption, for some of the rulers did wish to exercise their technical right to declare independence 
and others to join the neighboring dominion. If the rulers had exercised their right in such an unpatriotic manner, they would have found considerable support from influential elements hostile to the interests of this country. It was against this unpropitious background that the government of India invited the rulers of the states to accede on three subjects of defense, external affairs, and communications. At the time the proposal was put forward to the rulers, an assurance was given to them that they would retain the status quo except for accession on these subjects. It had been clear to them that this accession did not imply any financial liability on the part of the states and that there was no intention either to encroach on the internal autonomy or the sovereignty of the states or to fetter their discretion in respect of their acceptance of the new constitution of India. These commitments had to be borne in mind when the state's ministry approached the rulers for the integration of their state. There was nothing to compel or induce the rulers to merge the identity of their states. Any use of force would have not only been against our professed principles, but would have also caused serious repercussions. If the rulers had elected to stay out, they would have continued to draw the heavy civil lists which they were drawing before, and in a large number of cases, they could have continued to enjoy unrestricted use of the state's revenues. The minimum which we could offer to them as quid pro quo for parting with the ruling powers was to guarantee to them privy purses and certain privileges on a reasonable and defined basis. The privy purse settlements are therefore in the nature of consideration for the surrender of the rule by the rulers of all the ruling powers and also for the dissolution of the states as separate units. We would do well to remember that the British government spent enormous amounts in respect to the Maratha settlement alone. We are ourselves honoring the commitments of the British government in respect to the pensions of those rulers who helped them to consolidate their empire. Need we cavil then at the small, I purposely use the word small, price we have paid for the bloodless revolution which has affected the destinies of millions of our people. The capacity for mischief and trouble on the part of the rulers, if the settlement with them would not have been reached on a negotiated basis, was far greater than could be imagined at this stage. Let us do justice to them. Let us place ourselves in their position and then assess the value of their sacrifice. The rulers have now discharged their part of the obligations by transferring all ruling powers and by agreeing to the integration of their states. The main part of our obligation under these agreements is to ensure that the guarantees given by us in respect of privy purse are fully implemented. Our failure to do so would be a breach of faith and seriously prejudice the stabilization of the new order. Those words ring as true today as they were when they were spoken and it would be as wrong to question the binding nature of those commitments today as it would have been or recognized to be then. The aptness of what Sardar said can be better appreciated if it is borne in mind that the accession of one state alone in respect of which we have got entangled with a foreign power and whose security we have had to safeguard over the last 15 years must have cost us much more than the capitalized value of the total amount we spend on the privy purse commitments of 554 states covering many times the area and population of that state. With the seal of the Constituent Assembly's approval on integration and the finalization of the Constitution on the basis of the objective resolution of the Constituent Assembly, the sovereign democratic republic of India was constituted on the 26th January 1950, incorporating under one constitutional roof the hundreds of units that were inherited from the British on the 15th August 1947. Within less than three years, the specter of fragmentation and disintegration had not only been laid to rest, but India's unity and integrity had been consecrated by the pledged word and solemn covenant of the people of India. The ideals of justice, social, economic, and political 
of liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, of equality of status and of opportunity, and of fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation, became enshrined in the temple of united India. What was a dream of the thinkers, seers and philosophers of the past thousands of years became a reality in 1950. Many would be entitled to credit for this consummation, but few could share the same pedestal in stature as Gandhiji, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and Sardar. It was this holy trinity of the pantheon of Indian democracy that ultimately brought about the unity and integrity of the country in a manner that it defied our efforts throughout history. It is true that we had to pay a heavy price in partition for this achievement, but when it is realized that the gain has been a closer integration, a stronger union, and a powerful structure which has to its credit during the last 13 years a record of economic planning and administrative efficiency of a type which we could not have achieved under a loose federation with multiplicity of protections and safeguards, I am sure that the objective historian will not consider the price too much. Is it is that record to which record. I shall now briefly turn in order to bring out what a force the country's integration and unity have been in securing the development of the country on the lines that recent history shows it to be. The achievement of Indian unity, even on the scale of partitioned India, was an outstanding and unprecedented historical event, but what was even more remarkable was its fullness and completeness. There was not one square mile of area, apart from small islands of foreign possessions, which are also now absorbed, that was not directly linked with a strong central government through the accepted constitutional processes of a federation. The powers of the central government not only extended to all the important spheres of political, administrative, and economic life of a nation, but they also covered overriding jurisdiction in certain emergencies, not only connected with defense and security, but also with the breakdown of the constitutional machinery and with the financial stability or credit of India or of any part thereof. I realize that the Jammu and Kashmir state has been treated in a class by itself. The reasons are not of a permanent feature, but are, to my mind, a passing phase, and there is no doubt that as has happened in the past, in the future as well, the process of assimilation with the rest of India will continue, and that state also will take its due and honored place in Indian polity along with other states. The thoroughness and the completeness with which the unity was brought about are in themselves miraculous, but what is even more astonishing and borders really on the divine is the speed with which this was achieved. Sardar has, in his own words, described the conditions that prevailed in August 1947, which I have quoted earlier, but this is what the Prime Minister said in September 1948. Even I, who have been rather intimately connected with the state's people's movement for many years, if I had been asked six months ago what the course of developments would be in the next six months since then, I would have hesitated to say that such rapid changes would take place. The historian who looks back will no doubt consider this integration of the states into India as one of the dominant phases of India's history. What followed subsequent to September 1948 was even more remarkable than what had preceded it. If all these marvels of human endeavor and achievement are pieced together, and we take into account that Sardar had accomplished all this almost wholly through peaceful and constitutional means, during a short period of two years, not only must we acknowledge him as the architect of India's unity, which description was aptly selected by the Prime Minister for inscription on his statue in this very city, but also as one of the makers of the Indian history in modern times. No tribute can be too great, no gratitude too deep, no love too affectionate, and no reverence too profound for the son of India who secured this unity and to whose genius we owe the rich harvest that we have reaped out of that unity 
during the last 13 years and will continue to do so till eternity if we follow the path of true and patriotic citizenship. That rich harvest is written into the record of the development of the country since 1950. Time was when from Jammu to Kanyakumari, one had to pass through hundreds of jurisdictions of British Indian provinces and Indian states. Similar experience had to be undergone while journeying from Kutch to Assam. The multiplicity of jurisdictions gave rise to problems in the implementation of laws, which not only meant numerous delays, but also innumerable difficulties. The economic life of the country would have been subdivided into hundreds of compartments if the map of India today were the same as it was in August 1947. The Indian States Finance Inquiry Committee, to which I have referred earlier, has very realistically described the advantages that were to accrue from an integrated system of federal finance as a result of the financial integration of the states in the following words. There will emerge uniformity of law, rates, interpretation and administration of all federal fiscal measures resulting in uniform policies, principles and practice in the levy, assessment and collection of central taxes and duties. And tax evasion, always a serious evil, will be more effectively checked. The abolition of internal customs duties will result in freedom of trade within the country. A coordinated trade and tariff policy will have a uniform impact throughout the country. Ports and other important links in the country's system of communications and transport will be free to serve their natural hinterlands. National and regional economic planning on all India basis will become possible. In this, as in all other respects, the states will play their part and they will become entitled to all the benefits which accrue from the execution of such plans as require the aid of central resources and technical assistance. India will thus have an opportunity to emerge as a well-knit unit, fully integrated in all spheres, political, constitutional, and e economic. Its essential fundamental unity will be reinforced. This is the progress of the economic development of the country up to date fully bears out the assessment of that committee. Neither economic planning, nor administrative integration, nor uniformity of development and systems could have been achieved in the country without the integration and unity, the history of which I have attempted to summarize in these lectures. But more than this economic development, the sense of security and confidence in the future which has come from the growth and preservation of an integrated life of the Indian community is of considerable importance, for on that alone can be based ultimately an assurance of future progress. The integration is a program not for the time being, it is a program for generations and centuries. It has come much later in the life of the nation than it should have. What we have done in 15 years since independence should enable us to visualize what we could have done earlier. Had we, for instance, achieved this unity even in the beginning of this century, today, instead of considering ourselves a developing or an underdeveloped country, we would have been in the one of progress, at least in this continent, and would have been able to make a much greater mark on economic, social, and political life of the country than we have been able to do. From that point of view, Lack of unity was a criminal waste of opportunities and time. If we can learn only that lesson from the progress that we have made since achieving it, we will have learned from history what is generally a rare lesson indeed. Speaking of a wider field, namely our influence among the nations of the world, I would ask you to consider what standing we would have had among them if along with us as the Indian Dominion that came into being under the Indian Independence Act of July 1947, we would have had to carry the concurrence of more than 550 states in everything that we did. I would also like you to consider what respect would have been attached to our views and what consideration would have been given to our convictions in those situations. Today, if India can hold its head high among the nations of the world, it is because it has behind it the power and the unity of 439 million people of the country. Today, if we can have greater faith in our ability to defend ourselves, 
It is because our armed forces are knit into one structure as a result of the integration to which I have referred. Whether you take into account India's security and integrity or whether you take our standing in the Committee of Nations, there is no doubt that the Indian unity is an invaluable asset. If to this you add the very substantial and far-reaching advantages that we have derived in the spheres of economic development, social education, and numerous other fields of national activity, you are bound to regard that unity as the most decisive factor in building up our policies, programs, and plans, and also our international relationships. We cannot, however, rest on our laurels, nor take the future for granted. Pointing out the task for the new unions at the time of integration, Sardar made a statement of profound truth. It is as follows. We have to weave new fabrics into old materials. We have to make sure that simultaneously the old and the new are integrated into a pleasing whole, a design which would fit well into the pattern of all India. Almost overnight, we have introduced in these states the superstructure of a modern system of government. The inspiration and stimulus has come from above rather than from below. And unless the transplanted growth takes a healthy root in the soil, there will be a danger of collapse and chaos. Apart from these aspects, there is also the danger of sapping of our strength by wasteful effort in sheer destructive criticism or idle talks. There are also dangers of attempting too much with too small resources in too short a time. More than this, there are serious threats to our security from outside and from within. Often in the history of India, we have lost battles because we were disunited, because we did not recognize the march of the times, because our mind was still wedded to old and traditional ways, and because we could not assess in its proper perspective the end and consequences of many things that we did in an attitude of indifference or complacency. What has happened during the last one year may have shaken us out of that indifference, complacency or overweening confidence. But the fact remains that the unity which we have achieved can be lost and the integration which we have secured can be broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls. If the survey that I have undertaken can convince the audience or the readers that our unity has been won after a hard struggle and vicissitudes of fortunes throughout centuries, that the few years of real unity that we have had show how much we have lost by its absence during the earlier periods, and that this unity is a precious gift of time and democratic leadership in the recent past, it should be clear to them that it can be retained only if we can observe the discipline, imbibe the sense of responsibility, hearken to the patriotic instincts and show the common prudence of true citizenship. We have to go a long way in cultivating those virtues of seasoned and matured nations, but the situation is such that we must face up to the essential conditions of our existence. Let us hope and pray that providence will endow us with these virtues to sustain the responsibilities of freedom and independence that have devolved on us. The realization of our dream in actuality is a rare thing in this world that we have secured is an undoubted fact and will in future always remain a fact of history. It is our duty and our obligation to make it a fact of perpetual possession. Thank you.